I'm Jambo. Good morning, everyone. As they say back in South African, the Zulu language, Salbo Nani Lonke. All I'm saying is good morning to everyone. When I say Salbo Nani Lonke, you say Lonke. All right? Salbo Nani Lonke. All right, you're speaking Zulu. Amen. I'm delighted today to be with you. I am thankful to God for those who didn't have to go to work, but you decided not to stay home, and you came out today to be blessed. Has God been good to you? Has he been gracious? What about mercy? Has he been merciful to you? Praise God. We thank him for his grace and his mercy. Our hymn of meditation is my, the group ready? The hymn of meditation? Yes, they're here. It is customary whenever, wherever I've pastored, wherever I've preached for a sustained amount of time that a hymn of meditation calms me down and prepares my heart and the heart of the hearers for the message. It's not just any hymn. It's a, a hymn that is slow and meaningful. Follow the words as you sing. Oh, yes. Ah. 
Amen. Thank you, praise team. Thank you. I call your attention to the book of Acts. Chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. Acts, as you know, it's a euphemism for the activities of the apostles. I'd like to read in your hearing verses 13 through 15 will form the scriptural backdrop for my message this morning. Here's what it says. When a light wind began blowing from the south, the sailors thought they could make it. So they pulled up anchor and sailed close to the shore of Crete. But when the weather changed abruptly and a wind of typhoon strength called a northeaster burst across the island and blew us into sea, the sailors couldn't turn the ship into the wind. So they gave up and let it run before the gale. There's a word this morning from the Lord that can be found in this very text. As the theologians call it, a pericope. And for the next few minutes today, I would want to talk about the perfect storm. What did I say was the topic? The perfect storm. But before I talk with you, let us talk with God. Father in heaven, make this message clear and plain. Speak through your manservant. May my lips not stumble my tongue be clear. May the message reach every heart in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. It was in October 1991, somewhere off the shore of Gloucester in the state of Maine in the United States, six men, six men lost their lives in the midst of a storm aboard a fishing vessel called the Andrea Gale. Their story has been documented into a Pulitzer Prize winning novel and in 2001 that story was turned into a movie starring George Clooney. Meteorologists deemed this particular storm the perfect storm. Because on that storm, on that day, three storms were combined into one. It was reported that there were 250 miles, not kilometers, two. 150 mile per hour winds and 150 foot waves 
But that storm was deemed the perfect storm simply because of its contents. My brothers and sisters of Nairobi East, this encampment, I've just stopped by for the next few minutes this morning to simply suggest that it's not the contents of your storm that makes it perfect, but rather the consequence of your storm contributes to its perfection. The truth of the matter is that the value of your storm is deemed by the life lessons it leaves and what we can learn from those storms. There are those who would suggest that you and I constantly every day live in a storm cycle. That is to say that everybody sitting here, every person sitting here under the sound of my voice is in one of these three places. You're either, you're either hear me today, in the middle of a storm, you just came out of a storm, or you are, are, or you are on your way back to a storm. Is somebody hearing me today? What's the first thing I said? You are in the middle of a storm, right? You just, talk to me, you just came out of a storm or you are on your way back to a storm. And we need to understand what we must learn from storms if we are going to be able to call the one in this message the perfect storm. The words of this text come to us concerning the Apostle Paul. He had been arrested for preaching the gospel in Jerusalem. Paul had been tried before Felix and then before Festus. And ultimately he was taken before Herod Agrippa. It was there. Before Agrippa that Paul gave his testimony and after hearing the apostle testify, Agrippa said, you remember, you almost persuaded me to do what? To become a Christian. I pray this morning that there are no Agrippa congregants who will leave this church today with an invisible sign over your head, rejected Jesus again. You know, we shouldn't be almost persuaded. We should totally give in to our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, beloved brothers and sisters, there's too much going on in this world. I'm talking to the roof. Roof, there's too much going on in this world. I said there's too much going on in this world. Do you agree with me? Yes. Too much going on in this world. There are too many things that are going awry to be alive without Jesus. The pastor and I were talking last night after the sermon. And, and, and we were musing about what's happening in Ukraine. Do you know that's a crazy man in Russia? Do you know that? If you, if, you know what he was trying to do? He was trying to start World War III. Why are you all looking at me cross-eyed? Yes. And do you realize the high cost of living right now 
with the dollar killing all the other currencies as, as a result of that war. Do you realize that? We're living in dangerous times. Are you listening to me, church? Yes, and, and, and in order for us to be ready and be prepared for a storm, we got to be close to Jesus. Come on, somebody. And even worse, even worse, we cannot afford to be caught dead without Jesus. Appealing to Herod Agrippa on the basis of his Roman citizenship, the Apostle Paul asked to stand before the Roman Emperor Caesar. Agrippa agreed and Paul was placed as a prisoner on a boat heading towards Rome. On the way there, they encounter some difficult weather and they pulled ashore for a while to wait things out. That's when Paul warned them. And the Bible says that Paul said, I perceive that this trip is going to be disastrous. There's going to be some danger. And we need to stay right where we are. But the Bible says that the soldier the captain in charge of the ship, rather the soldier in charge of the ship, listened to the captain instead of the preacher. If somebody missed that, went over somebody's head. I'll say it again. <laughs> the Bible says that the soldier, Paul said, what did Paul say? He said, I perceive that there's going to be some bad weather. And we need to stay where? Right where we are. But the Bible says that the soldier in charge of the ship, I'm repeating this for emphasis, the soldier in charge of the ship listened to the captain instead of the preacher. You know that sounds very much like us. Amen, Ruth. <laughs> we, often, we often take our cues from the wrong people. Somebody say amen. Yes, 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 yes. You know, verse 13 says, this is the Bible. And if the Bible says it, I believe it. <laughs> verse 13 says, that when they felt a gentle wind. They thought that everything was all right to sail again. And so off they went. When out of nowhere, there arose a violent storm. And the text says that the men got caught up in the storm. And although the ship towed a small boat behind, the storm got so furious that they had to pull in their lifeboat to save it. I'm talking to somebody here today. You've had a little extra before the storm started. But the storm had gotten so bad that you've had to spend your reserve. That's the lifeboat. Come on, somebody. You know that little savings that you put away? Huh? Am I talking to somebody today? Yes, some, it happens to all of us. You've had to pull in your lifeboat. And the Bible says that at this point, Paul interrupted the men. And he testified saying, last night, not yesterday night. I know you like to say that. But last night. An angel of the Lord, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, we're going to lose the ship, but we'll make it through the storm. <laughs> I love that. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're going to make it through the storm. That was Paul's testimony. But the Bible says that after traveling for 14 days, how many days, everybody? 14 days and 14 nights without seeing the sun. Those men gave up all hope of being saved. And then Paul, the preacher, testified again and says, I know that you haven't seen the sun. And I know that your situation is dark. And I know that you feel discouraged. But I believe God and I'm going to take God at his word despite the, detail, the details of our situation. Is there anybody in here today in this church today who's made up your mind? Yes, it may be dark. The future may be dark. The, 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 the election is, is, in a, is in a state of, of suspension. It's raining, it's storming. The economy seems to be in a tailspin. The shilling is losing its value. Unemployment is going sky high. The prices of food seems unaffordable. But I believe God and I'm going to take God at his word despite the details of a stormy situation. Is somebody hearing me today? Yes, my brothers and sisters. Here they were, caught up in the storm. And the text says they began to get closer to the land. They then assessed the situation again. And there were a couple of men who decided, hear me today. Don't let anything distract you because this sermon is full of lessons. They assessed the situation again, brother pastor. And there were a couple of men who decided that they were going to abandon the ship. And Paul looked at the centurion again, the soldier. He looked at the soldier and said, we've got to stay together. We can't take sides. Hello? We can't get into cliques and groups. Hello, new life. We've got to, Paul says, what did he say? We've got to stay together. Everybody's got to stay on the ship. I'm talking to some husband here today. I'm talking to some wife here today. I'm talking to some adolescent. I'm talking to some church member. Everybody has to stay on the ship. Am I speaking truth today? And the Bible says that a sailor took a sounding again. And they ran into a sandbar. And the ship began to break into pieces. And the soldier in charge decided that he was going to kill the prisoners. But Paul told him, you don't have to kill us. For God, the God whom I serve, is going to spare every life. Just swim. Just swim for the shore. And just there's some of those who among us who cannot swim grab hold of a broken piece of the ship and float on in that broken piece. Hang on to the broken piece of the ship. Sometimes you get discouraged. Don't go to some witch doctor. Hang on to a broken piece of the ship. Are you listening to me, church? Yes, don't give up. And Paul says, your God, my God, our God, has so many ways by which he can and which he's willing to save us. Read Psalm 91. Huh? And it will tell us that God will shelter us under the shadow of his wings. I want to tell you today, church, 
God is an equal opportunity savior. Are you listening to me? And by the way, I just got a tweet from the Holy Spirit. Don't you trust anybody? Are you listening to me? Husbands, don't trust your wives. Wives, don't trust your husbands. I know that sounds controversial. The Bible never said trust somebody. The Bible said love everybody, but trust God. Are you listening to me? You thought you had me caught. Eh? Love everybody, but trust whom? God. Yes, you can't put your trust in man because we can fail you. And so, so Paul is saying the, our God is an equal opportunity savior. He will save everybody. And the Bible says that they made it to a little island called Malta. And it was there in that island called Malta that they took a head count. They took a what? And they discovered that all 276 men were alive and well. Yes, hallelujah, yes. Hey, church of the living God, listen to me this morning. This, this morning, there was a storm. Maybe there was even a shipwreck. But thank God there was also a shore. Is there anybody here today who's excited about the fact that there's land of safety somewhere? Well, that's the story. That's the story. But the fact of the matter is, before I sit down, I want to ask the question, what are some of the lessons that we can learn from the perfect storm? I want to suggest to you today first, and I want you to listen to me very carefully because I'm going to ask you some questions as we go along. First of all, there's some lessons. There what if somebody? What did I say? Some lessons that we could learn from what kind of storm? The perfect storm. And I want to suggest that the perfect storm teaches us how to get rid of that which is unnecessary. What the perfect storm teaches first of all? Don't whisper to me. Talk to, talk to me like you talk to your wife when you're shouting to them. How to get rid of unnecessary. I like the way that sounds. I'll play it again. How to get rid of the unnecessary. Yeah, the perfect song teaches us how to get rid of necessary. And the Bible says that in the midst, this thing can preach, in the midst of the storm, they evaluated the weight of the ship. And they discovered that we are too heavy to make it. It says, the Bible says, that they began to cast the extra cargo overboard with their own hands. I need to tell somebody at this camp meeting in this church today that in the midst of your storm, God, almighty God, will give you clarity as what you need in your life and what you don't need and what you need to throw away. There's also a word in this passage of human responsibility in the text. It says they cast the stuff where? Overboard with their own hands. I just stop by to tell you Somebody who's listening to me, that God will give you clarity in your storm. What you need to get rid of. Maybe, just maybe, it may be a bad attitude. Maybe, it may be a mean and demonic spirit. Just maybe, you may have a gossiping and a serpentine tongue. Maybe a bad relationship. But it's whose responsibility? Whose responsibility? Huh? Whose? Yes. They threw, they threw it with what? 
their own hands which tells me it's my responsibility not someone else's I've got to cast my bad habits overboard with my own hands and I just recently learned some important information about those vehicles that they send into space you know those, those, those countries that have the space program that whenever they get ready to send shuttles into space hear me today church there are instruments that are known as boosters attached to the shuttles. And I also learned that if you pay close attention, after they've been taken off to go into space, before the shuttle can reach orbit in their intended destinations, the boosters have to drop off. Ouch. Somebody in this house today, God is trying to take your life to the next level. And the Lord is trying to put you in spiritual orbit. I wonder if there's some space shuttle saints in the church today who've made up your mind to get rid of the unnecessary stuff in your life. There are some things in your life, in my life, that were necessary yesterday. Am I talking to somebody? Now let me ask you a question. Do we still need landline phones? Not necessarily. Hello? Isn't that right? It was necessary back then. Cell phones are the in thing now. And maybe if after we are dead and gone, we don't know what God would have. But there's some things that were necessary yesterday. But they're nothing but dead weight today. Oh, I ought to have some witnesses today in the house from those who have learned how to get rid of the un. And But there's something else in this text. Not only do we need, brother pastor, to get rid of the unnecessary, I want to suggest that in the midst of the perfect storm, you have to learn the value of keeping company with godly people. Mm, I like this. Look at the text. Look at the text. I'm preaching Bible here today. Uh, Paul told the centurion, <laughs> don't go. Remember? Early in the text I said that. Don't go. I perceive that this expedition is going to be what? A disaster for us. But no one listened to Paul, brother pastor. And they sailed because they thought all was well. But watch this. It was the same man that they ignored who was responsible for them to making it out of the storm. The Bible says, that Paul testified that the angel of the Lord told him that they would lose the ship, but not a single life would be lost. Isn't it interesting, church, that the very person they had refused to listen to end up being the very same reason they survived the situation? Therefore, in the midst of your storm, you can learn the value of seeking out and listening to godly people. I remember my grandmother. She was a school teacher, but she didn't have a degree as teachers today have. But you know what granny had? Common sense. Common sense. And she used to tell me, don't leave the house without permission. I heard her with, I heard her with this ear. And I opened this one, closed this one, and I went about my business. And let me tell you, every time I didn't listen to granny, I got into problems. Because granny was a godly woman who taught us Sabbath school lessons Memory verses in the morning 
and by night we had to rehearse them to her and 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 and, and i wish i still had granny around for my grandkids because my grandkids, I have a granddaughter, 15 years old. She knows everything she thinks. She said, Papa, you don't know. I, I, I'm telling you I'm right. Sometimes we need to listen to the preacher. Are you listening to me, church? Yes. I'll ask, I want to ask a question today. Is there a Paul on your ship? Is there anyone in your life who can get in touch with God on your behalf when you're going through the storm? Is there anybody who can get to Jesus and get him on the main line and tell him all about it for you? Is there anybody who can show up to your house when all hell has broken loose with a word from the Lord in the midst of of a storm. Now I have three types of friends. How many types? Now that, now that something happened to me when I turned 40. Somehow, I don't know why. Somehow I start getting very wise. About the company I keep. I have three types of friends. You like to know who they are? Number one. I have the friends that I grew up with. And every time I go back to New York. These are the guys that I grew up with. You know, we used to go into... We used to do a lot of naughty things, steal fruits and all of that and all that. But the Bible says, when I became a man, I put away all those things. When I go back to New York, I hang out with them just for about an hour. And then I find out I'm starting to talk like them. And behave like them. And the conversation starts to get risky. And so I've decided that those type of friends, I'll keep them at a distance. Are you listening to me? They're still my friends. If I get into trouble when I get to New York, they'll come to my aid. But I don't need to keep company with them. There's another type of friends that I have. That I know that if I get on a boat and they start to sink, they'll jump out and leave me alone. <laughs> you know those kind of friends? They're called dry weather friends. And then the third group of friends is like my friend, Pastor Kali. When we get together, we talk about the life and the ministry. And I've got some good friends, Pastor Randy Skeet and Pastor Wintley Phipps. And, and when we talk, we don't talk low stuff, nasty stuff. And these are godly people that help. You see something I realized? That I inherited a lot of bad things from Adam and Eve. You, you probably didn't, but I know I did. Hello? Did you inherit any? Why don't you shake your head at me? I'm blind. I want to hear you. Did you inherit any bad stuff from your ancestors? Yes, we did. And so I've learned to listen to godly people. And if there's a Paul on your ship, <laughs> because you ought to keep a Paul, you ought to be glad that the Paul is there. Oh, my brothers and sisters, don't, because no matter what storm you go through, there's always a word from the Lord available if there's a Paul on your ship. And that word helps you to hold on until the sun begins to shine again. Is there anybody in the church today who's ever shown up with a heavy heart? And a burdened spirit. But the Lord came down to you that day. Your God sent a word that was tailor made for your situation. And that word held you until the storm was over. The perfect storm teaches us what first? To get rid of the? You see, I'll stop listening to me. To get rid of a? I like this section here. To get rid of the? Unnecessary. The second thing it teaches us to do what? To get ready. Hold, keep company with ki what kind of people? Godly people. And that's the, the second thing. Then the perfect storm not only helps us to get rid of the unnecessary, not only teaches us the value of godly people, the first perfect storm further teaches us that you and I can make it on what's left. You can make it. 
Where is that in the text, brother pastor? Well, Paul told them, Parkinson, we're going to lose the ship. And those of you who can, swim for the shore. But those who can't, do what? Grab onto a broken piece. And you'll be able to make it to dry land. Somebody here at this camp meeting has been broken and fragmented by one storm after another. I just came all the way from Johannesburg to tell somebody, you can make it with what's left. Are you listening to me? Oh yes, hallelujah, yes. That's God's word today for somebody. And if you know God is talking to you, you ought to say thank you God for that one because you can make it with what's left. Are you listening to me, church? Yes. How do I know it? That you can make it what's left? Simply because you've got a broken piece and you've got a promise. The angel of the Lord does what? Encamp it round about them that fear him. Yes, you don't need a whole lot if God is on your side. Is there anybody in church today who's a witness that you can make it what's left? Somebody in the church, you, you have made a mistake. Somebody have decided, you know something I've discovered with Adventists, no matter where I go, and I haven't been, I haven't passed a lot of places. I passed in the United States. I pastored in Kenya, in Baraton. I pastored, I was a chaplain in Trinidad. And now I'm pastoring in Johannesburg. And one thing I notice, prayer meeting, very few people come. Same thing happens here. Prayer meeting, Wednesday night. Is it full? Tell me the truth. No, I'm not talking post-COVID. Tell me. Is it full? If, if it's full, it's good. No, I'm not saying, you know... I, it's not full. But you know when it's full? Business meeting. When you want to put somebody out of church. Am I speaking truth? Am I speaking truth? That's the time when the church gets full. Because some Pharisee wants to get rid of somebody that they're hiding in their own lives. I want that to sink in. My brothers and sisters, as I wind down, there's one thing more I didn't say. One thing. First, you got to do what? Secondly, three, you can on a broken piece. But there's one more thing before I sit down. You ought to walk away from the storm, knowing. And it's simply this. Kenyans, hear me today. If you hear, if you remember, if you forgot anything else that I say, hear me today. Some of you are worried about the outcome of this election. I want you to remember four words. How many words? Four words. Relax. God is in control. Are you listening to me? He sits high, but he looks low. God is in control. He took care of the ship. He took care of those 276 men. Oh, my brothers and sisters, my God is in control. And only a God is who is in control can send word, you're going to lose this ship. But not a single life will be lost. Hear me today. One day, the disciples were caught up in a storm situation. And, and, and they started, John and Peter and Andrew started saying, Hey, this paddle this way. Pull this way. Don't you tell me I know how to paddle. And they were fighting. And they forgot they had a passenger, a sleeping passenger, who made the wind and the storm. And he stood up. And he told that storm, shut up. And the storm, shut up. But the one thing I like about that story, my sister with the gray hair, one thing I like about that story, you know what? Not one single of those apostles jumped overboard. 
Not one of them. As dangerous as it was on the outside, it was safer in the boat on the inside. Don't leave the church. The devil is out there waiting outside the church. Don't leave the church. Are you listening to me? Don't leave the church. The Bible I believe in says, my God, your God, our God. Hey, chill, relax. God is in control. We'll sing song number Will Your Anchor Hold? Five, three, four. Will your anchor hold? All right. Is it your resolve, your determination to get rid of the stuff that don't matter? You know, I, <laughs> married life can teach you a whole lot of lessons. Anybody here married? I have learned not 
to argue with my wife because I can't win. I get rid of the unnecessary. And not that, not that she's not right, but I know I can't win. Gentlemen, am I right? We can't win. Get rid of the unnecessary. Second one. Huh? Come on, you forgot already? Huh? No, that's not the second one. Huh? Keep in God, oh yes, godly company. The third one? What? Huh? You can make it on what's left. The last one. Relax. Do you believe God is in control? Huh? He's in control. He's watching Kenya to see if you're a fair weather Christian. He's watching you, the Adventist people. Now, don't misunderstand me. You exercise your franchise. Leave it to God. I said leave it to God. He created this place. He created you. Leave it to God. He'll take care. Even if you don't get the person that you get, you trust God. Trust no man, but love each other. Hello, somebody. Who's determined today to stay in the ship? Come what me. God bless you. Let us sing the last stanza as we close this service. Sing it lustily. When our eyes behold in the dawning light, shining gates of pearl, shining gates of pearl, Ahaba bright, we shall anchor fast to the heavenly shore with the storm so fast forever. Sing it now. We have an anchor. God keeps us so oh, yes. steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Oh yes, fastened to the rock which cannot move. Grounded firm and be in the Savior's love. Aren't you happy you have a God you can trust? Aren't you happy you have a God who can trust? Yes, I can trust him. For when peace like a river attendeth your way, when sorrow like the sorrows billows grow whole, whatever your lot, he has taught us to say what? It is well. It is well. It is well. It is well. It is well with your soul. Father in heaven, thank you for reminding us that even the perfect storm, which has combined three storms into one, 276 men listened to the preacher and they were saved. And to God, right now, I'm not the person they should listen to, but to the quiet voice of the Holy Spirit. And may he continue to abide in this church. May he continue to guide us and protect us and hold us and resolve in our hearts that we're going to trust him come what may. May God bless this encampment. May God bless those who are faithful to come today. Those online, Lord, watch over them. Even those at work, keep them safe. And may this church be a model church not only in Nairobi, but in all of Kenya. That when this encampment is over, people in the outside will say, ooh, that person walks and talks and lives and acts like Jesus. I trust that would be our determination here today. In the loving name of Jesus Christ, amen.